Chapter 5 Yezhevikin There walked, or rather squeezed himself into the room, though the doors were very wide ones, a little figure which even in the doorway began wriggling, bowing and smirking, looking with extraordinary curiosity at all the persons present. It was a little pockmarked old man, with quick and furtive eyes, with a bald patch at the top of his head and another at the back, with a look of undefined, subtle mockery on his rather thick lips. He was wearing a very shabby dress coat, which looked as though it were second-hand. One button was hanging by a thread, two or three were completely missing. His high boots full of holes and his greasy cap were in keeping with his pitiful attire. He had a very dirty check pocket handkerchief in his hand, with which he wiped the sweat from his brow and temples. I noticed that the governess blushed slightly and looked rapidly at me. I fancied, too, that there was something proud and challenging in this glance. "'Straight from the town, benefactor, straight from there, my kind protector. "'I will tell you everything, only first let me pay my respects,' said the old man. "'And he went straight for Madame le Général, but stopped halfway and again addressed my uncle. "'You know my leading characteristic, benefactor, a sly rogue, a regular sly rogue. "'You know that as soon as I walk in I make for the chief person of the house.' I turn my toes in her direction, first of all, so as from the first step to win favor and protection. A sly rogue, my good sir, a sly rogue, benefactor. Allow me, my dear lady, allow me, your excellency, to kiss your dress, or I might sully with my lips your hand of gold of general's rank. Madame la Générale, to my surprise, gave him her hand to kiss rather graciously. "'And my respects to you, our beauty,' he went on. "'Miss Parapolitsyn, there is no help for it, madam. "'I am a sly rogue. "'As long ago as 1841 it was settled that I was a rogue, "'when I was dismissed from the service just at the time "'when Valentin Ignatievich Tihontsev became your honour. "'He was made an assessor, he was made an assessor, "'and I was made a rogue.' And, you know, I am so open by nature that I make no secret of it. It can't be helped. I have tried living honestly. I have tried it, but now I must try something else. Alexandra Yegorovna, our little apple in syrup, he went on, going round the table and making his way up to Sashenka. Let me kiss your dress. There is a smell of apples and all sorts of nice things about you, young lady. Our respects to the hero of the day. I have brought you a bow and arrow, my little sir. I was a whole morning making it. My lads helped me. We will shoot with it presently. And when you grow up, you will be an officer and cut off a Turk's head. Tatiana Ivanovna. But, oh, she is not here, my benefactress, or I would have kissed her dress too. Praskovia Ilinichna, my kindest friend, I can't get near you, or I would kiss your foot as well as your hand, so there. And Fisa Petrovna, I protest my profound respect for you. I prayed for you only today, benefactress, on my knees with tears I prayed for you, and for your son also, that God might send him honors of all sorts. And talents, too, talents especially. And by the way, our humblest duty to Ivan Ivanitch Mizinchikov. May God send you all that you desire for yourself, for you will never make out, sir, what you do want for yourself. Such a silent gentleman. Good day, Nastya. All my small fry send their love to you. They talk of you every day. And now a deep bow to my host. I come from the town, your honor, straight off from the town. And this, no doubt, is your nephew, who is being trained in a learned faculty. My humble duty, sir, let me have your hand. There was laughter. One could see that the old man played the part of an amateur clown. His arrival livened the party up. 
Many did not even understand his sarcasms, and yet he had made slight digs at them all. Only the governess, whom to my surprise he called simply Nastya, blushed and frowned. I was pulling back my hand, but I believe that was just what the horrid old man wanted. But I only asked to shake it, sir, if you will allow me, not to kiss it. And you thought I meant to kiss it? No, my dear sir, for the time being I will only shake it. I suppose you took me for the clown of the establishment, kind sir? He said, looking at me mockingly. No, no, really, I... To be sure, sir, if I am a fool, then someone else here is one too. Treat me with respect. I am not such a rogue yet as you imagine. Though maybe I am a clown too. I am a slave, my wife is a slave, and so there is nothing for it but flattery. That's how it is. You get something by it anyway, if only to make sop for the children. Sugar, scatter as much sugar as you can and everything. That will make things more wholesome for you. I tell you this in secret, sir. Maybe you will have need of it. Fortune has been hard on me. That is why I am a clown. He, 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 the old man is a comical fellow. He always makes us laugh, piped Anfisa Petrovna. My dear madam and benefactress, a fool has a better time of it in this world. If I had only known that, I would have enlisted among the fools in early childhood. And I dare say by now I might have been a wise man. But as it is, I wanted to be a clever man at first, so now I am a fool in my old age. Tell me, please, interposed Obnoskin. He probably was not pleased by the remark about talents, lolling in a particularly free and easy way in his armchair and staring at the old man through his eyeglass as though at an insect. Tell me, please. I always forget your surname. What the deuce is it? Oh, my dear sir, why my surname, if it please you, is Yezhevikin. But what does that matter? Here I have been sitting without a job these nine years. I just go on living in accordance with the laws of nature. And my children, my children are simply a family of homeskies. As the proverb goes, the rich man has calves, the poor man has kids. Oh, yes, calves. But that's beside the point. Come, listen, I have been wanting to ask you a long time. Why is it that when you come in you look back at once? It's very funny. Why do I look back? Why, I am always fancying, sir, that someone behind me wants to slap me on the back and squash me like a fly. And that is why I look round. I have become a monomaniac, sir. Again there was laughter. The governess got up from her seat as though she would go away, but sank back in her chair again. There was a look of pain and suffering on her face, in spite of the color that flooded her cheeks. "'You know who it is, my boy,' my uncle whispered. "'It's her father, you know.' I stared at my uncle open-eyed. The name of Yezhevikin had completely slipped out of my mind. I had been playing the hero, had been dreaming all the journey of my proposed bride, had been building magnificent plans for her benefit, and had utterly forgotten her name, or rather had taken no notice of it from the first. "'What? Her father?' I answered also in a whisper. "'Why, I thought she was an orphan.' It's her father, my boy, her father. And do you know, a most honest, a most honorable man, and he does not even drink, but only plays at being a fool. Fearfully poor, my boy, eight children. They live on Nastya's salary. He was turned out of the service through his tongue. He comes here every week. He is such a proud fellow. Nothing will induce him to take help. I have offered it. Many times I have offered it. He won't take it. An embittered man. Well, Yevgraf Lelyanich, what news have you? Uncle asked and slapped him warmly on the shoulder, noticing that the suspicious old man was already listening to our conversation. What news, benefactor? 
Valentin Ignatyevich made a statement about Trishin's case yesterday. The flower under his charge turned out to be short weight. It is that Trishin, madam, who looks at you and puffs like a samovar. Perhaps you graciously remember him. So, Valentin Ignatyevich writes of Trishin. If, said he, the often-mentioned Trishin could not guard his own niece's honour, she eloped with an officer last year, how, said he, should he take care of government property? He stuck that into his report. By God, I am not lying. Fie, what stories you tell, cried Anfisa Petrovna. Just so, just so, just so. You've overshot the mark, friend Yavgrov, my uncle chimed in. Ay, your tongue will be your ruin. You are a straightforward man, honourable and upright, I can say that. But you have a venomous tongue. And I can't understand how it is you can't get on with them. They seem good-natured people, simple. Kind friend and benefactor, but it's just the simple man that I am afraid of cried the old man with peculiar fervor. I liked the answer. I went rapidly up to Yezhevikin and warmly pressed his hand. The truth is I wanted in some way to protest against the general tone and to show my sympathy for the old man openly. And perhaps, who knows, perhaps I wanted to raise myself in the opinion of Nastasya Yevgrafovna, but my movement led to no good. "'Allow me to ask you,' I said, blushing and flustered as usual, "'have you heard of the Jesuits?' "'No, my good sir, I haven't. "'Well, maybe something, though how should we? "'But why? "'Oh, I meant to tell you something apropos, "'but remind me some other time. "'But now let me assure you, I understand you and... Know how to appreciate. And utterly confused, I gripped his hand again. Certainly, I will remind you, sir, certainly. I will write it in golden letters. If you will allow me, I'll tie a knot in my handkerchief. And he actually looked for a dry corner in his dirty, snuffy handkerchief and tied a knot in it. Yevgrof Larionich, take your tea said Praskovya Ilinichna. Immediately, my beautiful lady. Immediately, my princess, I mean, not my lady. That's in return for your tea. I met Stepan Alexievich Batcheyev on the road, madam. He was so festive that I didn't know what to make of it. I began to wonder whether he wasn't going to get married. Flatter away, flatter away, he said in a half-whisper, winking at me and screwing up his eyes as he carried his cup by me. "'And how is it that my benefactor, my chief one, Foma Fomich, is not to be seen? Isn't he coming to tea?' My uncle started as though he had been stung and glanced timidly at his mother. "'I really don't know,' he answered uncertainly with a strange perturbation. We sent for him, but he... I don't know, really. Perhaps he is indisposed. I have already sent Vidopriasov, and... Perhaps I ought to go to him myself, though. I just went into him myself just now, Yeshevikin brought out mysteriously. Is it possible? cried out my uncle in alarm. Well, how was it? I went into him first of all. I paid him my respects. His honor said he should drink his tea in solitude, and then added that a crust of dry bread would be enough for him, yes. These words seemed to strike absolute terror into my uncle. But you should have explained to him, Yevgraf Lelyanich. You should have told him, my uncle said at last, looking at the old man with distress and reproach. I did, I did. Well? For a long time he did not deign to answer me. He was sitting over some mathematical problem. He was working out something. One could see it was a brain-racking problem. He drew the breaches of Pythagoras while I was there. I saw him myself. 
I repeated it three times. Only at the fourth he raised his head and seemed to see me for the first time. I am not coming, he said. A learned gentleman has arrived here now, so I should be out of place beside a luminary like that. He made use of that expression, beside a luminary. And the horrid old man stole a sly glance at me. That is just what I expected, cried my uncle, clasping his hands. That's how I thought it would be. He says that about you, Sergei, that you are a learned gentleman. Well, what's to be done now? I must confess, uncle, I answered with dignity, shrugging my shoulders. It seems to me such an absurd refusal that it is not worth noticing, and I really wonder at your being troubled by it. Oh, my boy, you know nothing about it, he cried with a vigorous wave of his hand. It's no use grieving now, sir, Miss Peripolitsyn put in suddenly, since all the wicked causes of it have come from you in the first place, Yegor Ilyich. If you take off your head, you don't weep for your hair. You should have listened to your mamma, sir, and you would have had no cause for tears now. Why, how am I to blame, Anna Nilovna? Have some fear of God, said my uncle in an imploring voice, as though begging for an explanation. I do fear God, Yegor Ilyich, but it all comes from your being an egoist, sir, and not loving your mother, Miss Peripolitan answered with dignity. Why didn't you respect her wishes in the first place? She is your mother, sir. And I am not likely to tell you a lie, sir. I am a major's daughter myself, and not just anybody, sir. It seemed to me that Miss Peripolitsyn had intervened in the conversation with the sole object of informing us all, and me in particular as a newcomer, that she was a major's daughter and not just anybody. It's because he ill-treats his own mother, Madame la Générale herself brought out at last in a menacing voice. Mamma, have mercy on us. How am I ill-treating you? It is because you are a black-hearted egoist, Yegorushka, Madame la Générale went on, growing more and more animated. Mamma, Mamma, in what way am I a black-hearted egoist? cried my uncle, almost in despair. For five days, for five whole days, you have been angry with me and will not speak to me. And what for? What for? Let them judge me. Let the whole world judge me. But let them hear my defense, too. I have long kept silent, Mama. You would not hear me. Let these people hear me now. And Fisa Petrovna, Pavel Semyonitch, generous Pavel Semyonitch, Sergei, my dear... You are an outsider. You are, so to speak, a spectator. You can judge impartially. Calm yourself, Yego Ilyich. Calm yourself, cried Anfisa Petrovna. Don't kill your mamma. I am not killing my mamma, Anfisa Petrovna. But here I lay bare my heart. You can strike at it. My uncle went on, worked up to the utmost pitch, as people of weak character sometimes are, when they are driven out of all patience, though their heat is like the fire of burning straws. I want to say, Anfisa Petrovna, that I am not ill-treating anyone. I start with saying that Foma Fomich is the noblest and the most honorable of men, and a man of superior qualities too, but... but he has been unjust to me in this case. Hmm, grunted Obnoskin, as though he wanted to irritate my uncle still more. Pavel Semyonitch, noble-hearted Pavel Semyonitch, can you really think that I am, so to speak, an unfeeling stone? Why, I see, I understand, with tears in my heart I may say I understand, that all this misunderstanding comes from the excess of his affection for me. But say what you like, he really is unjust in this case. I will tell you all about it. I want to tell the whole story, Anfisa Petrovna, clearly and in full detail, that you may see from what the thing started, 
and whether Mama is right in being angry with me for not satisfying Foma Fomich. And you listen too, Seryoja, he added, addressing me, which he did, indeed, during the rest of his story, as though he were afraid of his other listeners and doubtful of their sympathy. You, too, listen and decide whether I am right or wrong. You will see what the whole business arose from. A week ago, yes, not more than a week, my old chief, General Rusopitov, was passing through our town with his wife and stepdaughter, and broke the journey there. I was overwhelmed. I hastened to seize the opportunity. I flew over, presented myself, and invited them to dinner. He promised to come if it were possible. He is a very fine man, I assure you. He is conspicuous for his virtues and is a man of the highest rank into the bargain. He has been a benefactor to his stepdaughter. He married an orphan girl to an admirable young man, now a lawyer at Malinova, still a young man, but with, one may say, an all-round education. In short, he is a general of generals. Well, of course, there was a tremendous fuss and bustle in the house. Cooks, fricassees. I sent for an orchestra. I was delighted, of course, and looked festive. Foma Fomich did not like my being delighted and looking festive. He sat down to the table. I remember, too, he was handed his favorite jelly and cream. He sat on and on without saying a word, then all at once jumped up. I am being insulted, insulted. But why, in what way are you being insulted, Foma Fomich? You despise me now, he said. You are taken up with generals now. You think more of generals now than of me. Well, of course, I am making a long story short, so to say. I am only giving you the pith of it. But if only you knew what he said besides. In a word, he stirred me to my inmost depths. What was I to do? I was depressed by it, of course. It was a blow to me, I may say. I went about like a cock drenched with rain. The festive day arrived. The general sent to say he couldn't come. He apologized. So he was not coming. I went to Foma. Come, Foma, I said. Set your mind at rest. He is not coming. And would you believe it? He wouldn't forgive me. And that was the end of it. I have been insulted, he said. And that is all about it. I said this and that. No, he said. You can go to your generals. You think more of generals than of me. You have broken our bonds of friendship, he said. Of course, my dear, I understand what he was angry over. I am not a block. I am not a sheep. I am not a perfect post. It was, of course, from the excess of his affection for me, from jealousy. He says that himself. He is jealous of the general on my account. He is afraid of losing my affection. He is testing me. He wants to see how much I am ready to sacrifice for him. No, he said, I am just as good as a general for you. I am myself, your excellency for you. I will be reconciled to you when you prove your respect for me. In what way am I to prove my respect for you, Foma Fomich? Call me for a whole day, your excellency, says he, then you will prove your respect. I felt as though I were dropping from the clouds. You can picture my amazement. That will serve you, said he, as a lesson not to be in ecstasies at the sight of generals when there are other people, perhaps superior to all your generals. Well, at that point I lost patience, I confess it. I confess it openly. Form a formage, I said, is such a thing possible? Can I take it upon myself to do it? Can I, have I the right to promote you to be a general? Think who it is bestows the rank of a general. How can I address you as your excellency? Why, it is infringing the decrees of providence. Why, the general is an honor to his country. The general has faced the enemy. He has shed his blood on the field of honor. How am I to call you your excellency? He would not give way. There was no doing anything. 
Whatever you want, Foma, I said. I will do anything for you. Here you told me to shave off my whiskers because they were not patriotic enough. I shaved them off. I frowned, but I did shave them. What is more, I will do anything you like, only do give up the rank of a general. No, said he, I won't be reconciled till you call me your excellency. That, said he, will be good for your moral character. It will humble your spirit, said he. And so now for a week, a whole week, he won't speak to me. He is cross to everyone that comes. He heard about you, that you were learned. That was my fault. I got warm and said too much. So he said he would not set foot in the house if you came into it. So I am not learned enough for you now, said he. So there will be trouble when he hears now about Kurovkin. Come now, please, tell me in what way have I been to blame? Was I to take on myself to call him your excellency? Why, it is impossible to live in such a position. What did he drive poor Batyev away from the table today for? Supposing Batyev is not a great astronomer, why, I am not a great astronomer, and you are not a great astronomer. Why is it? Why is it? Because you are envious, Yegorushka, mumbled Madame la Générale again. Mama, cried my uncle in despair, you will drive me out of my mind. Those are not your words. You are repeating what others say, Mama. I am, in fact, made out a stone, a block, a lamppost, and not your son. I heard, Uncle, I interposed, utterly amazed by his story. I heard from Batyev, I don't know whether it was true or not, that Foma Fomich was jealous of Ilyusha's name day and declares that tomorrow is his name day too. I must own that this characteristic touch so astounded me that I... His birthday, my dear, his birthday, my uncle interrupted me, speaking rapidly. He only made a mistake in the word, but he is right. Tomorrow is his birthday. Truth, my boy, before everything. It's not his birthday at all, cried Sashenka. Not his birthday, cried my uncle in a fluster. It's not his birthday, Papa. You simply say what isn't true to deceive yourself and to satisfy Foma Fomich. His birthday was in March. Don't you remember, too, we went on a pilgrimage to the monastery just before, and he wouldn't let anyone sit in peace in the carriage? He kept crying out that the cushion was crushing his side and pinching us. He pinched Auntie twice in his ill humor. I am fond of camellias, he said, for I have the taste of the most refined society, and you grudge picking me any from the conservatory. And all day long he sulked and grizzled and would not talk to us. I fancy that if a bomb had fallen in the middle of the room, it would not have astounded and alarmed them all as much as this open mutiny. And of whom? of a little girl who was not even permitted to speak aloud in her grandmother's presence. Madame la Générale, dumb with amazement and fury, rose from her seat, stood erect and stared at her insolent grandchild, unable to believe her eyes. My uncle was paralyzed with horror. "'She is allowed to do just as she likes. She wants to be the death of her grandmother,' cried Miss Perapolitsyn. Sasha, Sasha, think what you are saying. What's the matter with you, Sasha? cried my uncle, rushing from one to the other, from his mother to Sashenka to stop her. I won't hold my tongue, Papa, cried Sashenka, leaping up from her chair with flashing eyes and stamping with her feet. I won't hold my tongue. We have all suffered too long from Foma Fomich, from your nasty, horrid Foma Fomich. Foma Fomich will be the ruin of us all, for people keep on telling him that he is so clever, generous, noble, learned, a mix-up of all the virtues, a sort of potpourri, and like an idiot, Foma Fomich believes it all. So many nice things are offered to him that anyone else would be ashamed, but Foma Fomich gobbles up all that is put before him and asks for more. 
You'll see, he will be the ruin of us all, and it's all Papa's fault. Horrid, horrid former formage. I speak straight out. I am not afraid of anyone. He is stupid, ill-tempered, dirty, ungentlemanly, cruel-hearted, a bully, a mischief-maker, a liar. Oh, I'd turn him out of the house this minute, I would, but Papa adores him. Papa is crazy over him. Oh, shrieked her grandmother, and she fell in a swoon on the sofa. Agafya Timofyevna, my angel, cried Anfisa Petrovna, take my smelling salts. Water, make haste, water. Water, water, shouted my uncle. Mama, mama, calm yourself. I beg you on my knees to calm yourself. You ought to be kept on bread and water and shut up in a dark room. You're a murderess. Miss Parapolitsyn, shaking with spite, hissed at Sashenka. I will be kept on bread and water. I am not afraid of anything, cried Sashenka, moved to frenzy in her turn. I will defend Papa because he can't defend himself. Who is he? Who is your former foamage compared with Papa? He eats Papa's bread and insults Papa, the ungrateful creature. I would tear him to pieces, your former foamage. I challenge him to a duel and shoot him on the spot with two pistols. Sasha, Sasha, cried my uncle in despair. Another word and I am ruined, hopelessly ruined. Papa, cried Sashenka, flinging herself headlong at her father, dissolving into tears and hugging him in her arms. Papa, how can you ruin yourself like this? You are so kind and good and merry and clever. How can you give in to that horrid, ungrateful man, be his plaything, and let him turn you into ridicule? Papa, my precious Papa! She burst into sobs, covered her face with her hands, and ran out of the room. A fearful hubbub followed. Madame la Générale lay in a swoon. My uncle was kneeling beside her, kissing her hands. Miss Parapolitsyn was wriggling about them and casting spiteful but triumphant glances at us. And Fisa Petrovna was moistening the old lady's temples and applying her smelling salts. Praskovya Ilinichna was shedding tears and trembling. Yezhevikin was looking for a corner to seek refuge in, while the governess stood pale and completely overwhelmed with terror. Mazinchikov was the only one who remained unchanged. He got up, went to the window, and began looking out of it, resolutely declining to pay attention to the scene around him. All at once Madame la Générale sat up, drew herself up, and scanned me with a menacing eye. "'Go away!' she shouted, stamping her foot at me. I must confess that this I had not in the least expected. Go away! Go out of the house! What has he come for? Don't let me see a trace of him! Mama, Mama, what do you mean? Why, this is Seryozha! my uncle muttered, shaking all over with terror. Why, he has come to pay us a visit, Mama! What, Seryozha? Nonsense! I won't hear a word! Go away! It's Korovkin! I am convinced it is Korovkin! My presentiments never deceive me! He has come to turn Foma Fomich out! He has been sent for with that very object! I have a presentiment in my heart! Go away, you scoundrel! Uncle, if this is how it is, I said, spluttering with honest indignation, then excuse me, I'll... And I reached after my hat. Sergey, Sergey, what are you about? Well, this really is... Mama, this is Seryozha. Sergey, upon my word, he cried, racing after me and trying to take away my hat. You are my visitor. You'll stay, I wish it. She doesn't mean it, he went on in a whisper. She only goes on like this when she is angry. You only keep out of her sight just at first. Keep out of the way and it will all pass over. She will forgive you, I assure you. She is good-natured, only she works herself up. You hear she takes you for Korovkin, but afterwards she will forgive you, I assure you. What do you want? 
he cried to Gavrila, who came into the room trembling with fear. Gavrila came in not alone. With him was a very pretty peasant boy of sixteen, who had been taken as a house serf on account of his good looks, as I heard afterwards. His name was Falale. He was wearing a peculiar costume, a red silk shirt with embroidery at the neck, and a belt of gold braid, full black velveteen breeches, and goatskin boots turned over with red. This costume was designed by Madame la Générale herself. The boy was sobbing bitterly, and tears rolled one after another from his big blue eyes. "'What's this now?' cried my uncle. "'What has happened? Speak, you ruffian!' "'Former Fomich told us to come here. He is coming after us himself,' answered the despondent Gavrila. "'Me for an examination, while he—' "'He? He has been dancing, sir,' answered Gavrila in a tearful voice. "'Dancing?' cried my uncle in horror. "'Dancing!' blubbered Falale with a sob. "'The Komarinsky?' "'Yes, the Komarinsky!' "'And Foma Fomich found him?' "'Yes, he found me.' "'You'll be the death of me,' cried my uncle. "'I am done for!' And he clutched his head in both hands. "'Foma Fomich,' Vidopliasov announced, entering the room. The door opened, and Foma Fomich in his own person stood facing the perplexed company. Breaking in. With respect to the timing of the plot, Foma Fomich is our buffoon of the past, as outlined in Chapter 1, while Yezhevikin is our buffoon of the present. The comparisons and contrasts here will be of thematic importance. Clearly the man is very bright, as he can sniff out the social dynamics with acute intuition. Among other things, he has hinted at Mr. Bacheyev's possible infatuation with Praskovya Ilinichna, the narrator's meek aunt. Bacheyev was protesting against her in particular, and woman in general in Chapter 2, but hints in Chapters 3 and 5 suggest that he was protesting a bit too much. Yezhevikin's backstory is a bit unclear, although perhaps the details are not that important. Apparently he was fired from the civil service at the same time his rival received a promotion. The colonel suggests that his firing was due to his venomous tongue, although one wonders if that's the whole story, especially in an environment as corrupt as Dostoevsky understood the civil service to be. Curiously, the backstory gives us the rare opportunity of dating a Dostoevskyan plot with precision. Yezhevikin was sacked in 1841 and has been unemployed for nine years. Combined with our knowledge of name days from Chapter 2, we can say that this tea party takes place on July 19, 1850. Dostoevsky runs close to an anachronism, however, since the novel The Simpleton, which the narrator references in the prior chapter, was published in 1850, I'm unsure of whether before or after July. This chapter also has what I believe to be the first dig at Catholicism to appear in the Dostoevsky corpus, as we see in that odd moment where the narrator admires Yezhevikin's distrust of simple people. The narrator's comment suggests that he views the Jesuits as schemers who put on a facade of being simple and honest, The reaction apparently stems from Dostoevsky's own political disagreements with Jesuit Poles in the Siberian prison camp. Dostoevsky would continue to attack the Catholic Church, and the Jesuits in particular, in the writings ahead. 
Finally, the Kamarinsky is a very high-energy Russian folk dance, which typically continues until the dancer runs out of steam. The mystery surrounding the colonel's strange horror over a teenager being caught in the act of performing it is about to be cleared up. End of comments.